those events and more work. Uh, we also want to thank uh, the folks here at our host venue. Hey, welcome, come on in. Uh, uh, we want to thank our, our fo the folks here at Galvanize, uh, where we're holding this event in San Francisco. Uh, the whole team here has been great. They've got a fantastic space. Uh, that's their food uh, that we order, so if you like the food, uh, order food from Galvanize if you're in San Francisco. Uh, but Heidi and Mario, Taya, Andy, Bernadette, Victoria, the whole team here, uh, you guys have been fantastic. We really appreciate you letting us come here uh, and talk policy. Um, and for those who are streaming online, if you're, if you're watching this, uh, you can follow this conversation on Twitter. Uh, use the hashtag uh, Digital Platform Act, uh, which is up here on the screen. Uh, or uh, just keep following uh, Digital Platform Act for conversations about uh, the people and about uh, this conversation generally. Um, from both knowledge and, and all of our allies. Um, so, we have two parts to the program today. Uh, so, we're going to talk about part one. Uh, but first, I wanted to just uh, remind folks about why, uh, why we're holding this event and why we think this conversation is really important. Uh, because, uh, as I said, we're a DC based organization in Washington, and there's a lot of conversation about uh, uh, what we were calling the tech clash in Washington, uh, backlash against technology companies. Uh, and that conversation that we're engaged in and folks are engaged in in Washington uh, really seems to be centered around pushing certain priorities, certain values around innovation, free expression, uh, competition, and uh, consumer choice, but also balanced with uh, interest about fighting hate speech, fighting piracy, uh, fighting extreme and terrorist content online, uh, and promoting quality journalism, and all of those values are wrapped up in a really complicated conversation. Uh, that led to public knowledge uh, and our author Harold Fell writing some of the uh, that we are promoting today. Um, and we don't think those values are mutually exclusive, but we think that when you make good policy around those values, that it's important that we have uh, facts rise to the top, uh, that technical experts are listened to, um, and that uh, all stakeholders at the table to make sure that those values are balanced. Um, and so that's what led us to um, ask Harold to put it this ebook. Um, and, and we hope that it will be a framework uh, for ongoing conversation. Uh, we know not everybody's going to agree with everything in the book. That's, uh, that's also a good thing. But we want to have people engage with it. Uh, we want people to engage with the ideas um, and be a part of the conversation. Uh, we don't think that securing a digital marketplace is going to be achieved by the goodwill of companies alone. Uh, it requires a public conversation that leads to smart policy that's uh, analysis based. Um, and so that's why we want to have this event, have further conversations like this. Um, so, with that, I'm going to hand things over to uh, part one of the event, and then I'll come back to part two. Uh, but part one of our event is a one on one conversation with the author of, of a really fantastic ebook uh, called The Case for the Digital Platform Act uh, Market Structure and Regulation. Uh, and some of you, when you came in, uh, we were handing out the check in. We have uh, the executive summary of the book. And on it, there is a, uh, a QR code that can take you to the, where you can download the book. Uh, or you can just go to digitalplatformact.com, download the ebook, check it out. We also have some QR codes floating around uh, upstairs and downstairs here. Uh, we hope you'll read the whole book if you haven't. Uh, and, and get back to us a couple of and tell us what you think about it. But, uh, uh, here to talk about the book is Harold Feld, who uh, was our author at Public Knowledge. Harold is Senior Vice President of Public Knowledge, uh, and uh, his book is uh, by our sense available on our website, AbilableDigitalPlatformNet.com. And today, we're very lucky that uh, joining Harold in the conversation uh, is journalist Mike Swift. Uh, Mike is Chief Global Digital Risk Correspondent at MLX. It's a mouthful. It is a mouthful. <laughs> Uh, and that Mike's market insight. Uh, and, and, and Mike's a, a talented award-winning journalist who has been uh, covering antitrust policy, covering regulatory policy around the tech industry for many years. Um, before MLX, he was with the San Jose Record News and SiliconAngle.com. Uh, he told me he cut his teeth in New England uh, at Parker Current, the oldest, longest running. The oldest continuously published newspaper in America. There you go. Older so, than the Republic. Older than the Republic. So if you're Hartford, let's hear it. So uh, we're, we're very lucky that he's here uh, to help us engage in this conversation. And so with that, I'm going to kick it over to Mike and to Harold. Take it away. Uh, hi, everybody. It's really an honor to be here. Um, uh, if I keep moving around, 
around a little bit is because I have the sun going right into my eyes. So, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll muddle through as the sun moves. Um, thanks for being here. I think we really want this to be a dialogue. We're going to look at your questions. I see a lot of uh, great policy people out here in the, in the audience, and we want to have a chance for you to interact a little bit with Harold as well. So we'll make sure we do that. Um, this morning, thanks to the, uh, the magic of the international dateline, I started the day in Seoul, Korea, and um, where uh, my news organization, Alex, has really been writing about how uh, the Koreans are really looking at blowing up their whole privacy enforcement system, which is kind of interesting because um, they have one of the strictest privacy uh, enforcement apparatus in the world right now. But they feel like it's important to be much more in concert with the European Union. So, they're basically remaking the three agencies that, that enforce privacy in Korea, putting it down to one with the goal of getting an adequacy uh, agreement from Europe. And sort of the basis behind that, that belief is that um, they're not doing this for the big companies like Samsung and LG. They're doing it for really small, medium-sized companies, startups. They really want to open that market uh, to Europe. They want to open up Europe to, to those small players. And um, I just think that's kind of interesting because uh, the Koreans believe, in this case, that more regulation can actually mean more products, better products, more innovation. And uh, I think uh, people like me in Silicon Valley for the past 15 years haven't always had that belief. I think um, after 15 years reporting here, I often thought that thanks to Section, it's thanks to section 230 and the fact that Washington got out of the way of Sand Hill Road and why Combinator is you know, the reason why we have um, these amazing products that we do today. And um, I think 2018 maybe told us that, uh, that that approach is not going to work anymore and we need to find a different one. And uh, that's why I'm really excited to be here talking to Harold about his book, um, uh, The Starfish Problem. And um, so why don't we jump right into that. Um, um, so just a few hours ago, Mark Zuckerberg said that the government should not take a big hammer to Facebook or, or the other big platforms. You know, as we speak, Elizabeth Warren's on the stage debating with other Democratic candidates, no doubt talking about antitrust. And um, you know, this looks like this, is, this year is going to be the first. 2020 is going to be the first time since 1912 where antitrust is actually a real uh, issue in the presidential campaign. And um, you know, so much of when we hear about the, 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 this, this debate, it's really about, you know, should we just break up the big tech companies, take a big hammer, as Mark Zuckerberg put it. And, um, you know, it sounds good because it sounds like what Teddy Roosevelt did with Standard Oil, you know, back a century ago. But, you know, why is that the wrong way to think about this problem? Well, I call this the starfish problem precisely because um, you can uh, spend a lot of time in New England. I grew up uh, um, in New England, and one of the things uh, um, that I used to hear a lot was that uh, the lobster fishermen would have this problem with starfish. They'd come in and they'd get into the lobster traps and you know ruin the catch. So initially, what they would do is just tear up the starfish to kill them and throw them back in the water. And what happens, of course, is the starfish grow back. Not only do, does you know, a starfish grow new arms. Sometimes you tear a starfish up into a bunch of different pieces and you get three or four new starfish because they just regenerate. So what I call the starfish problem is when we look at the tech sector and particularly this area of digital platforms, which I argue in the book is a clearly definable sector of the economy. Um, we have to ask ourselves, why did this end up this way? It wasn't a standard oil thing where there was one genius who was a master of cartel who put all of this together. Um, what happened was economic forces drive these companies um, to particular strategies of market dominance. And we've had a bunch of um, reports coming out from antitrust experts in Europe and the United States and the UK. Uh, and, uh, Pretty much the consensus is that these platforms experience really huge network effects. Um, they get enormous economies of scale and can scale up quickly. Um, that creates the um, urge to do blitz scaling. Um, just, just crank it up until you dominate your segment of the market. So 
we can't just smash them up and expect that they'll stay smashed up. Um, we need to uh, uh, have in place a <coughs> regulatory regime that uh, addresses pretty much all of the issues and concerns that are coming up, because these problems are not just different and separate. I don't know whether I agree with Mark Zuckerberg about don't break up Facebook. I think that has to be on the table, even though we shouldn't kid ourselves about how you know, easy that would be. But the answer might be that he's right, we shouldn't, that there are other things we should do, like interoperability and unbundling. But the one thing he said that I totally agree with is breaking up Facebook is not going to solve the content problem. And we need to understand what we're trying to do when uh, we're intervening in the market, whether it's uh, regulation to make the market work better, whether it's regulation to preserve our fundamental values about democracy, um, and whether it's antitrust intervention to break up companies that have gotten too big, we got to know what we're trying to do. So you don't have to uh, go back to the book of Ecclesiastes to know there's nothing new under the sun, right? And um, you know, a century ago, we had um, many other innovative then innovative communications uh, technologies, the telegraph, uh, the telephone, the radio. Um, what, can we, what, what sort of issues did they have that they raise? And, and can we learn from you know, what the response was to those technologies? Right, and it's important um, to uh, understand that a lot of the issues that we're talking about, network effects, scale, economies of scale, uh, concerns about democracy, uh, all go back to this 150 years of evolving disruptive communication technology. Human beings are at heart communicating creatures, and we think to ourselves, wow, Facebook's the first thing that has linked together two billion people. Well, actually, the telegraph was the first thing that linked together two billion people. Not all at once, you know, it wasn't exactly the same, and we shouldn't just think it was exactly the same, but, you know, if you look at the question of, you know, what was enabled by these new disruptive technologies. News from around the world, commerce happening almost immediately as compared to the old uh, standards where it used to take months to send a message. And then the flip side of how the telegraph companies became information gatekeepers, how they manipulated elections, how we couldn't confirm, and we see this over and over again. I have a great article from Columbia Law Journal in 1939 the Federal Communications Commission and radio censorship, which asks, well, you know, we don't like all the hate speech that was on radio, and we don't like the set of advertising, but, you know, do we really want the government to be making these decisions through license renewals and, you know, private censorship, government censorship? Uh, if you scratch out, you know, radio and put in Facebook or, you know, YouTube, um, a lot of the arguments that you see uh, uh, there would resonate with us today. So what is the consequence of doing nothing? Because it's clear that over the last year, um, the regulators have gotten the attention of Facebook, I mean, and, and Google and the other big platforms. Um, um, can't we really trust that now the heat is on, that uh, and they know they need to change, uh, that Facebook's army of security specialists and their new AI tools are, are really going to be able to deal with this problem on their own? Well, first of all, they can't. Uh, no, the first, number one, this isn't about a single company. It's not like, do I like Facebook? It's not, do I like YouTube? Not, do I like Facebook and YouTube? I think Twitter does, but there's, this is about a sector of the economy. And if we take off the uh, you know, hat that wants to make this a revenge story about, you know, evil, uh, um, you know, people doing bad things, you know, or kind of a Frankenstein story of, you know, people tampering with that which should not be tampered with. And actually start thinking about this in terms of policy, we recognize, look, this didn't happen by accident. And there's no good way for companies to deal with it internally, even if they want to. One thing, they have all the wrong incentives. But the other thing, there is no person named Facebook even Mark Zuckerberg doesn't actually control the day-to-day -day operations of Facebook. And let me pick on some other companies because, you know, part of this is it's very easy to pick on Facebook right now. But, you know, Reddit just suspended the uh, Donald Trump uh, subgroup because there were physical threats of violence. And 
Reddit is by no means a dominant platform by any single measure. But if we care about consequences of content moderation, depending on what we're trying to do, then we do or don't care about what happens on, uh, on Reddit. So uh, I think, first of all, my message to everyone about, you know, who cannot get over their techno-determinism and hardcore libertarianism, get over it, please. <laughs> Get over it. Think every time you drive down the street, you are not engaging in micro negotiations with people about whether to stop at red lights or on which side of the road to drive on. Believe me, those are totally arbitrary decisions that we could have let the market resolve. But it turned out to just be so much easier to say, okay, you drive on this side, and when this little light turns red, you stop. And we all agreed to it, not because it was intrinsically more efficient than having it be green be stop and red be go, but because you had to choose something. Rules make markets work better. Now, you can write rules that make markets work worse. You absolutely can do all sorts of crappy things with rules. You know, It's not like all rules are good. You know? But the plain fact is that you do nothing, and this is the world we're going to get, and it's going to keep being this world. Because if you look at what drives it, it's not because, oh, we just need to twist the, uh, uh, the tail of these guys and make the nerd harder. There's real underlying issues of economics, limitations on human beings. And finally, I you know, will acknowledge this really in the introduction of my book, and you know, a lot of people disagree. I believe it is the fundamental role of government to set the rules for society. That in a free and democratic society, we don't outsource this to a handful of giant companies where they promise to behave. That it is actually the job of government to set the core rules about what kind of communications are we gonna, gonna allow, uh, what threats of violence or uh, you know, negative things do we find put society at risk? Uh, and what kind of a business environment are we going to have in terms of you know, moderating these enormous network effects and economies of scale? So let's talk about the term platform because um, you know, I'll plead guilty to this. I throw that term around a lot in my writing and I, I, I think I probably have kind of a hazy definition of what it actually is. How do you define it, and why did you choose it as really the organizing principle for uh, the Starfish Talk? Yeah, uh, first let me say, in the last couple of months, we have seen a number of reports come out from the European Union, the United Kingdom, uh, different antitrust uh, uh, centers here in the United States that have come out with conclusions that echo a lot of what I have in the book, uh, for which I'm enormously grateful because I actually uh, uh, was thinking about this from the perspective of telecommunications and kind of from a telecommunications background and history background. And it's nice to see that um, the antitrust and economics uh, analysis uh, works in the same way and we reach pretty similar results from different uh, avenues. But everybody focuses in on a couple of things. One, delivery through the internet solves one of the biggest problems traditionally associated with networks, which is enormous expense of build-out. It's not cheap to build something as big and distributed and reliable as uh, YouTube or Twitter, but the fact that you don't also have to build the last mile network out to uh, the customer enormously reduces cost as compared to, say, the telegram or cable systems or broadband. Uh, number two, the multi-sided platform, uh, which creates particularly strong network effects. What we generally mean by network effects are this idea that the more people are on the network, the more valuable it is. And most of us think this is a fairly straightforward relationship. But there are different types of networks. Some relationships are stronger than others. The fact that these platforms are capable of allowing people to perform multiple functions simultaneously, to self-organize into different groups, um, gives them a particular economic power and stickiness that 
goes beyond, say, cable television or um, other sorts of traditional uh, uh, network impacts. And finally, uh, the fact that um, these uh, businesses um, are uh, um, able to control the information so that there's uh, what I call perfect information asymmetry between uh, the business and the consumer. You see the interface, you have no idea what lies behind the interface. Um, that uh, that means that it is particularly difficult to identify when there is an issue. So the ability to quote, vote with your feet if you don't like a particular platform uh, is virtually non-existent. The fact that we discovered that in 2016, um, you know, Facebook was doing things with our personal data that we didn't like may make it so that in 2018 some people may be, but the reality is you now have another two or three years of built up investment in the platform. The platform is that much bigger, its network effects are that much powerful, more powerful. Um, and there is simply no way that the market can respond uh, to uh, what's going on behind the curtain. So typically, uh, antitrust law looks at factors like market dominance, concentration, and um, you're proposing really a, a, a new metric, the cost of exclusion, which is really a fresh idea. Could you talk about that a little bit and explain that to us? Yeah, one of the things that pretty much all of the competition reports that I've read agree with is the traditional metrics of antitrust have real problems with the, um, these digital platforms. Not just because we have narrowed and narrowed antitrust under the consumer welfare standards, sort of the general critique of antitrust uh, and how it's gone in the last 40 years, but because they challenge a lot of the ideas. Antitrust assumes that the market generally works fine, there are bad actors who abuse their dominant position, um, and you go in and you remedy that problem, and you can isolate the issue to a particular uh, geographic market usually, and identify a particular product market or service market. That's hard to do for a lot of these digital platforms. What is Facebook's market? Well, Facebook's market is Facebook. Um, you know, Google, we say, okay, Google is search, but it does a lot of additional things besides search that help to um, you know, make it that much more sticky. Um, we have, uh, uh, you know, I'm now, broadcasting this over Twitter, the micro-blogging site that is now also apparently a do-it-yourself broadcaster. Um, but Twitter is not the actual broadcaster in the broadcasting sense. If anything, it's like a uh, uh, cable access channel. But uh, uh, again, these things are not easily identified. So what I say is, let's look at the thing that everybody agrees um, gives the digital platform its power, this network effect. And particularly powerful sorts of network effects. And I borrowed a concept from uh, telecommunications that was originally developed um, to describe the digital divide um, and explain why getting people on broadband networks was important, not just because once you are on, you enjoy a powerful advantage, but because as more people get on, the cost of not being on the network begins to rise exponentially. So, I start with, it's an advantage to me. The more people get on, the more of an advantage is. Then you'll get a tipping point where the incremental advantage to me starts to level off. You know, the difference between 300 million people on Twitter and 400 million people on Twitter in the United States who speak English um, is relatively minor. Um, whereas, if you are tr a business trying to communicate to customers through Twitter, um, the more of your competitors who are on Twitter, the more of your customers who are on Twitter, um, the more it is a disadvantage to you not to be able to use that service. So what I've said is, okay, let's go to the root of the issue, where the market power here resides, which is not so much in any specific market share, but in the power of the network and the power to exclude people from the platform and use that as the metric of market. So another piece of uh, breaking news today um, that uh, my organization, and you know, let's shameless plug there, uh, <laughs> reported uh, uh, the House of Representatives uh, today approved uh, an additional $40 million in funding for the Federal Trade Commission for uh, enhanced competition and 
privacy enforcement, which is, I think, we can all agree, probably good news. Um, you're really proposing to create a new regulator. Why can't an existing agency, such as the FTC, do this job? Well, as I point out in the book, you could go with the Federal Trade Commission and modify it. You'd have to change it in a way that would make it radically different from what it does now. The, the list of tools that it needs, and again, it's not just about antitrust. And again, so antitrust and privacy. Well, okay, privacy relates to some degree to antitrust, but they're, they're different. And then it's antitrust, privacy, and content moderation. And antitrust, privacy, content moderation, and consumer protection of various types, and election regulation. So there's a lot of things in there that the FCC does not traditionally do, and you'd have to essentially create a whole new agency that would specialize in this particular uh, um, sector of the economy in order to uh, uh, do the job right. Uh, you could go with something like the Federal Communications Commission, which is at least closer, but there are a lot of reasons why I wouldn't trust them, looking at you, Agent Pie. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but in particular, because one of the critiques of agencies, which to some degree is true, is not so much capture in the sense of direct control, again, look at you, Agent Pie, but uh, the uh, problem of the agency starts to think of things in a particular way. So one of the critiques of the FCC during the time when we regulated at and as a monopoly was it was too slow to introduce competition and was too solicitous of at and Well, yeah, but that's because their mission for 50 years had been preserving the stability of the network and making sure that it was available to everybody at affordable rates and that 911 or whatever we were using at the time in your area as the yeah, emergency phone number work for life, it was a very different way of looking at the world. So yeah, the FCC does a number of the things that we want to um, take a look at, and they have uh, um, you know, uh, experience with networks, experience with some forms of these questions about content, but they have a very particular way of looking at things that uh, I don't think is suitable for um, the uh, new economy. What I'd like to see is for us to start fresh. I believe very strongly in the lessons of history. I believe that this is some magic black box that either we do nothing because it will anger the genie that lives in the black box and gives us these wonders, or we just tell people to do whatever the hell we want, you know, and the black box will produce the right outcome because we just nerve hard enough you can take down terrorist content before it even gets posted. Um, so, you know, there is a, a thing there that we have to look at and respect need to be informed by the lessons of the past, but they shouldn't control what we're trying to do here. The values remain the same, but the rules have to be tailored to the specific sector of the economy. So, um, just to defend Ajit Pai, he's, <laughs> he's an entertaining follow on Twitter, at least, you know, so I don't know where he comes up with that stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, you know, take us through your regulatory toolkit. Uh, this new federal platform regulator, what will it be able to do? What tools will it have at its disposal? Just, just give us a quick rundown on that. So what we would want to have is an agency that is empowered both in terms of economic competition policy. Um, so there's a list of things that we look to as remedies that have worked, interoperability, Data portability, which is seen as being the same as telephone number portability. Um, we get uh, um, uh, certain types of privacy protection, particularly for competitors on the platform, so that the platform can't use businesses that are using it as you know, essentially a form of customer research and then leap in and take advantage of that as Amazon and some other platforms have been accused of doing. Um, so we want to have this uh, um, agency that's empowered to review mergers and look at the specifics of this in a way that antitrust agencies are not generally empowered to do, looking at whether they serve the public interest, not merely whether there is going to be a loss of uh, competition. Uh, we need to, um, to have an agency that is frankly empowered to uh, split up uh, uh, companies where appropriate. Uh, People do not realize just how 
critical the FCC was in both the original AT&T breakup and in maintaining the separate pieces for so many years. Uh, the internet that people in, uh, seem to think, you know, bloomed without any sort of government rental regulation was a direct result of several decisions of the FCC regulating the telephone network, saying, yeah, you know, you've got to let uh, rivals use your network. You can't discriminate in favor of your own products. In fact, we're not even let you get into these lines of business because if we did, you'd immediately monopolize the market. So we need all of that, but we can't forget the content side. Right? Um, we need to make sure that democracy is protected. And by that, I don't just mean ways in which we try to deal with fake news, um, but ways in which we address uh, the problems of filter bubbles and what do we do to try to nudge people to have an interest or at the very least prevent algorithms from shepherding us unconsciously into filter bubbles that we would not seek out for ourselves. That's one of the biggest problems when you look at this is not just, well, I only want conservative voices or I only want progressive voices. I can do that on TV today by just tuning into my favorite uh, um, you know, network that reflects my particular political view. The real danger is an algorithm that is trying to provide the most engaging content for us and ends up being like this invisible sheepdog that is moving us in a particular direction so that we do not have what Cass Sunstein has called an architecture of serendipity, the finding of things that we normally just would not find. So we need an agency that can look at that while being mindful and respectful of the First Amendment, while being mindful of uh, freedom of expression. Um, and finally, we need an agency that is capable of harnessing these platforms for public safety uses. I was on an advisory committee to FEMA for uh, two years, um, and one of the big areas is the use of social media um, and other digital platforms for public safety. Um, and that's not a euphemism for spying on people. I mean, like, actually tailored information about, okay, you know, when the county tweets out, here are the five places you can go if you need, uh, uh, if you've been evacuated uh, because of a wildfire, um, and people are able to respond in real time to somebody and forward that message and retweet that message. You know, that's a very powerful thing. And having an agency that helps to organize that and make sure that those capabilities continue to be built into platforms. While again, mindful of privacy and other concerns is critically important. So as a guy who's been uh, covering the uh, antitrust litigation against Apple for seven years, and it's gone all the way up to the Supreme Court, and it's now back at the district court, we're actually finally after seven years starting to get to you know, the meat of the dispute. I've always been incredibly frustrated about um, trying to use antitrust as to, to regulate tech. And the thing I found really exciting about your approach is that you know you have elements of privacy law, privacy by design. We haven't even talked about intellectual property, but you know, you, you're you're talking about uh, free licensing of uh, you know, fair and fair and reasonable and non-discriminatory non discriminatory terms. And why is it so important to sort of break down those walls and to sort of take these what happen in separate disciplines of antitrust, privacy, intellectual property, and, and sort of bring them together? One regulatory umbrella. All policy is going to be trade offs. And the issue is not are we going to be able to have perfect privacy, nor what that does to competition policy. Um, because perfect privacy has implications for competition privacy, and there are some trade offs there. We're not going to be able to say interoperability, good or bad. <coughs> You know, that may be good for, uh, um, you know, well, certain types of things, bad for uh, the ability to disseminate the harmful content. Um, we need to be mindful of these trade-offs, and we need to do them in a rational way. We're never going to be perfect, but I am sick of hearing people talk about regulatory humility when what they mean is don't do anything. Because the decision not to act is a decision. And when you say, well, I'm afraid because it might have an unintended consequence, I'm like, okay, so you do your best in a complex system to try to figure out what those are going to be, and you have mechanisms for course correction. And the way you solve that is by not saying it's just an antitrust problem 
or it's just a consumer protection problem. There is no such thing as pure consumer protection that exists in some platonic ideal. Um, it is always going to be very specific to the nature of the industry, to the uh, um, facts. But when we look at you know something where you say, yeah, fraud is bad. Um, what role social media should have in taking down fraudulent things, especially when you know I don't think homeopathic medicine works. I think it's a fraud, but there are a lot of people out there who would be very upset if I got to say social media should treat all ads for homeopathic uh, uh, services as fraud, or all chiropractic as fraud. Whereas we pretty much will agree that yeah, actual fraud where you know you're deceiving people, we should be doing something. But then we get to the harms that are unique to the sector. And we look at things like the, these dark design ideas where traditional antitrust is not going to help you out there. Yeah. The idea that, you know, the fact that you've been trained by an industry that when something is highlighted, um, it means one thing, so I can trick you by making the opposite thing highlighted, is not something that antitrust pays attention to, but it is something that a sophisticated regulator can pay attention to. And that's why we need to combine all of these disciplines <coughs> into one oversight agency. Well, I'd like to open this up to questions. Um, uh, uh, I think uh, we have a, a mic that is going to take the rounds around the room. Um, um, I certainly could ask some more questions, but uh, I'm sure you guys have some great things to ask. Hey, Daryl. So I'm on board. I'm with you. What is the legislative vehicle to make this happen over the next, say, 6, 12, 18 months? So this is a big bite. And <laughs> one of the things I point out in my book is, OK, we need to recognize that it took four tries before we got the Communications Act of 1934. Um, and uh, in the intervening um, approximately 25 years, um, actually 20 years, um, use cases changed, technology changed. It was an evolutionary process. So I think that um, you know uh, we can get some things in motion. I think we certainly can get the framework um, in motion. Uh, I think that uh, um, at the moment there is no uh, vehicle because everyone in Congress is still thinking of these in their various silos. Um, the fact that it took us this long to get people looking at just privacy and say, well, maybe we actually should have some kind of federal privacy law, um, you know, tells you something about the speed at which this moves. Uh, at the same time, I do think that uh, um, we're seeing this be an election issue. Um, we are seeing that people care about this. The more these things become embedded in our lives, and the more these things become embedded in commerce, the more people are looking to both the federal government and state governments um, for solutions. And bluntly, um, I have to say, the thing that drove uh, um, you know, uh, the uh, uh, companies and therefore certain members of Congress um, to be willing to talk about national uh, privacy law in a serious way was California passed a strong privacy law. So while I'm not sold on the idea that every state needs to have its own comprehensive digital platform regulatory framework, I do have to say that one thing that would kick Congress in the pants is if uh, we had a state like New York or California um, say, yeah, you know what, if you, the federal government, are going to do this, we're going to pass elements of this on our own. And the prospect of that kind of a patchwork would drive uh, Congress to uh, to act in a much more serious way. Thank you. Um, so it makes sense when we have things like privacy and IP fall under like one bucket, under one department. But it seems like with certain tech companies out over here, right, it affects regulations in transportation, say, with rideshare companies. So I was curious as to your thoughts on uh, where the limits of this one regulatory body, whether it extends to like transportation companies or whether it extends to hospitality. So I was curious as to your thoughts about that. It's an excellent question because what I like to say, for example, with the Federal Communication Commission or 
of the Food and Drug Administration is you have specialized agencies whose authority is narrow but deep, uh, meaning they have what, at least on the surface of the statute, look like really extraordinary powers. But those are tolerable because they address a fairly narrow um, uh, area of uh, commerce. It's important. I mean, you know, the uh, um, FCC uh, deals with uh, uh, you know multi-billion-dollar uh, industries that are at the heart of our uh, national information infrastructure. Uh, but at the end of the day, their powers are tolerable because they do not regulate everything that connects to that infrastructure. They just regulate the infrastructure. So um, on the other hand, we do have a lot of cases where you have multiple agency overlap. Banks, for example, um, you have uh, um, you know, certain types of uh, uh, food and drug uh, advertising is regulated by both the FDA and the FTC. So I do think there is room for overlap. What I'd like to see is the digital authority address the uniquely platform issues. And we see this in uh, other specialized areas too. You know, when uh, Walgreens um, is regulated as a pharmacy, they're regulated by you know, the FDA and the Drug Enforcement Agency. But when they're regulated locally around things like zoning or if their prices are uh, um, deceptively advertised or whatever, they're regulated by state uh, um, consumer protection law and the FTC. I think we can do the same thing for folks like Airbnb or uh, Uber, where we say, yeah, elements that are in this platform will have, the things that make you part of this sector should be addressed by the digital authority. Whereas, whether you're violating uh, local uh, uh, laws about rental housing or uh, you're discriminating against uh, um, you know, what people based on you know, race or sexual orientation, um, we can leave those with the same agencies that have investigated them. I, I wanted to ask a question about what you Uh, um, time frame 
frame that is just ridiculous, and I say, all right, not only is that never going to happen and it's a waste of time, it's going to be an investment of a lot of money and effort in policies that are just not implementable, which will either lead to very uneven implementation in you know, ways, or where we just abandon the effort and have to start again two years from now. On the other hand, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe you can uh, make people do this, so um, you know, um, that's why it's important for uh, uh, geographic regions to, uh, and sovereign uh, uh, nations to create laws that they feel uh, implement their uh, values. I'm just glad that you than me. But would a single regulator fix that, I guess? I think a single regulator is better at this kind of thing because they have a great deal of expertise. The efficiency of where you refer within the agency is better. So, you know, at the FCC, maybe something goes to the Media Bureau or something goes to the Wireless Bureau, but, you know, you know if it has to do with Comcast that whether it's going to the Common Carrier, or, excuse me, the Wireline Competition Bureau or the Media Bureau, it's at least going to be handled by the FCC. And if it's an important <coughs> issue, um, the people who are running the agency are able to stay uh, on top of it. Um, plus, there is this trick. So you say, okay, you know, I need to be able to take care of content that is harmful to people. I have to balance that against free expression. I have to balance that against technical feasibility. It is much easier to make that balancing in an agency that is a sector-specific regulator than it is among multiple agencies, at least that's been our experience here in the United States, and the financial uh, collapse is actually uh, been pointed to as one of the places where multiple agencies got played against each other. Okay. Oh. Uh, like I was just saying, I'm super supportive in general, but I, I feel like I haven't heard too much about advertising, and that seems to me to be where all, or a lot of the money and power of these networks come from. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. Well, yeah, I, mean, I think addressing the advertising issues is one of the things that a sector regulator will be able to do in a sophisticated way. Um, I think that, first of all, and I argued with the FCC a lot about this during the privacy rulemaking, it's not just advertising. Uh, you know, just on top of my little uh, uh, access to grind, uh, it turns out that uh, some of the uh, uh, geographic, real-time geographic location data that uh, one of the carriers sold to bounty hunters was directly responsible for a shootout by bounty hunters at a uh, uh, Texas used car dealership that killed a couple of people. Oopsie. Um, it turns out that there are reasons we have very strict rules around this. But my point there is the personal information stuff is not just about advertising, even though people mostly conceptualize it at the moment as advertising. Um, again, a sophisticated agency regulator will be able to uh, examine that. But uh, I do think with regard to advertising itself, number one, I don't believe that we need the level of information for targeted advertising in order to provide free services. Um, I understand the rationale um, is that you can extract a higher premium, but when you dig right down to it, there isn't a lot of evidence showing that you get significantly better results from these highly targeted ads. In fact, the best results you got in one study I got was when people knew the ads were being targeted at them because it made them feel like the ad had been curated to be directed at them. So if you tell people they're targeted ads, but they're not, you know, we may achieve better results. Um, again, though, this is also a place where I feel society can and should set limits, um, where it's like, yeah, I don't care if targeted ads work better. Um, the you know, fact that we think that it's wrong for you to be able to exploit people in a moment of weakness um, by calculating the moment when they are most vulnerable to particular appeals is a societal judgment, and it's one that we should take seriously. Um, yeah, I have a question about just PR in general, because um, I saw Facebook use this line recently, I thought it was kind of compelling, about using, like, I guess, arguing against any legislation because of what China's done with their internet, and um, yeah, any thoughts on that? And also just unique problems that these kind of legislations face generally because a lot of the public discourse happens on the very networks you're trying to regulate. Well, at least Facebook didn't claim that we shouldn't be regulated because otherwise we'd lose the 5G rates. That's really the point. <laughs> but my point is that people will make all kinds of statements 
So, and part of the problem is that companies aren't always lying. Um, sometimes they actually have a good point. Um, so you can't just casually disregard. But some of these things, like, well, we wouldn't want to do it because, you know, that would give you the same capacity that, you know, China has. I'm like, yeah, but no. The answer to that is you build safeguards into the system or you avoid certain sorts of centralized filtering that would give a government the ability to do this sort of thing. But I do agree that there are problems with some of these where anytime you start to make a content moderation system or a tracking system or any of these, you know, NSA and uh, the rest will like sneak up and say, hey, would you put a back door in for us? We promise not to abuse it. Um, and, you know, history shows that every time that happens, sure enough, it gets abused. So, yeah, there, there are issues, but the consequence of that is to create safeguards. You know, the FCC, for better or worse, we did a lot of things to protect it from, to protect our infrastructure regulator from the kind of direct abuse that you see in a lot of other countries where it's directly incorporated into the executive. Um, we don't appreciate how much having the Federal Trade Commission or the FCC or the FDA be independent um, agencies. Um, but the fact that, um, you know, Donald Trump can't just gain somebody's license um, or can't do what, say, uh, you know, Erdogan does in Turkey, which is every time uh, um, there's a you know, broadcaster that's critical of him, and suddenly, you know, there's an audit team there to discover that they have all of these infractions and they suddenly owe two billion lira. Um, so there are some legitimate concerns, but the answer is to build in democratic safeguards and oversight, not to just throw up our hands. Mike, uh, I think this is the last question, and we're going to go to our, our second part, our part two. Hey, Carl, I don't have a demographics question for you. So, hi, person I've never seen before who knows about my obsession with demographics. <laughs> so, I've seen you observe in other contexts that we are at sort of a generational shift in our current sort of political landscape. And you seem to be trying to fuse together with your argument here um, understanding this nuance of the, both the promise and the peril of these platforms. And bring at the same time the wisdom of the ancient past of both your past experience in media policy and things like public access television that a newer generation may not be familiar with the changes in the media landscape. So, my question to you, Harold, is are you too early or are you too late? Basically, right the Well, I like to think of just in time. Uh, <laughs> One of the things actually that's been uh, um, a sore point for me for a large number of years has been precisely this generational divide and the tendency of folks on either side of it um, to dismiss um, the other generation as, you know, with contempt, to put it mildly. Um, you know, all of the, I've been reading uh, Senator Tufekki's Twitter and Tear Gas, which I recommend to everybody, by the way. Um, and one of the things she points out is that one of the reasons why social media snuck in under the radar of many countries was because the people running the countries just couldn't imagine why this was significant. They bought into the whole slacktivism disregard of what organizing online was. By the same token, I also um, see people um, in the internet generation who fail to understand that um, one of the reasons why politics is the way it is is because of traditional media. Um, and the way that industry is structured, and that bluntly, you're going to have 30% of people believing, or 40% of people have it, is believing that global warming is a Chinese hoax because they listen to Rush and they listen to talk radio. Um, and all the Facebook in the world doesn't matter to them. Uh, so uh, I do think that it's important to uh, bridge that. Uh, I, as Frankly, as somebody who's Gen X and their word and word on both sides of the uh, <laughs> uh, that the snake, I, I feel quite at home in that position. Um, but yeah, um, I do think that it's important for uh, um, for uh, people to realize on each side of the yeah, demographic line what the other really has to offer in terms of lessons. Well, Harold, uh, this has been great. Thanks so much. Uh, I think you have a really fresh idea. It's, a, it's a, sort of a new point of view, and I hope it, it gets a lot of attention. Thank you. Harold and Mike, thank you so much. Uh, I work in the same office as Harold, and every day he, he does what he just did uh, here with the
you guys, uh, and he always has a preference that uh, I have to go build up for no reading. So uh, thank you, <laughs> Carol. Thank you, Mike, for, for uh, helping us with that conversation. I'm going to ask our part two panel to come up front. Uh, all of you guys can make your way in front and grab a seat. Um, we've got about 45 minutes. Wow. We've got about 45 minutes left here in the event. Uh, but we wanted to have a reaction panel up here because, uh, as I said at the beginning, as our panel came up here, uh, it's really important to us in public knowledge that uh, this be the beginning of a conversation. Uh, uh, that we want to happen in public. We really hope that this, this, these ideas around the, an expert uh, uh, digital agency uh, are taken seriously by policymakers. We hope uh, the Congress will look at it. But, but it doesn't mean it's the only idea out there. And certainly, it's important that this policy is made that all stakeholders are at the table. Uh, and so we've got an interesting mix of, of folks here uh, who are going to help us engage in a, a bit more conversation. And we will uh, come back out to the audience for more questions for them. So uh, keep thinking of things that you want to ask. But uh, I'm going to help moderate this. And uh, thank you, thank you guys for, for coming and participating in this today. I'm going to introduce um, our group here going down the line. Um, uh, first, to my immediate right, uh, we're, we're fortunate to have, uh, we, we promoted uh, Leslie coming, but uh, from Google, but Leslie could make today. And uh, on short notice, uh, Jess Hammerly, who is the Public Policy and Government Affairs Manager at Google, is with us. Thank you for coming, Jess. Uh, to her right, we had uh, Mitch Stoltz, who's senior staff attorney at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, an advocacy group that we work with uh, very often. So thank you for being here. Mitch, they're based here in San Francisco. Um, uh, to his right, we have uh, Dina Srivasa, uh, who is an antitrust scholar and an author and just moved to the San Francisco area. Uh, so uh, we're glad that she's here to participate. Uh, to her right, we have uh, Amy O'Connell, who is the Public Policy Director and Head of Content Distribution Algorithm Policy at Facebook. Andy, you win the prize for the longest, uh, longest uh, uh, title here on the panel. Congratulations. Uh, no, really, uh, Andy, thank you for coming. Uh, we appreciate that you're going to come and participate with us uh, and bring your expertise. And then on the extreme end of the panel here, uh, we have our very good friend from uh, Mozilla, who is the sponsor of the event. Uh, our old friend Chris Riley, who is Director of Public Policy at Mozilla. So Chris, thank you for being here. Thank you for your help with the event. Um, so folks, uh, what I want to do to start off this conversation is kind of uh, go down the line and, and ask folks, uh, because I know, um, you know, Harold's uh, ebook, uh, which folks have read uh, and, and checked out and heard the conversation beforehand, uh, is wide ranging and has this sort of urging idea of a, of a digital agency, uh, an expert agency, uh, an expert regulator, uh, but it also has a whole suite of, of ideas uh, for conversation and debate uh, uh, for regulatory fixes, uh, and it, it uh, crosses content moderation, it crosses uh, competition issues. So I was hoping each of you could maybe take a minute to just uh, share, is there one major piece of Harold's uh, proposal, Harold's book, that really stood out to you that you thought that's really strong, that's really important, I agree with that. Um, and, and also, is there is there one that you're like, ah, I'm not so sure about that, and we'd love to hear, hear uh, what that concern might be. Um, so why don't I start with you, Jess, as you're right next to me. Um, make sure the mic is on, and, and I'll let you take it from there.
conversation, uh, you know, we could get into the nitty gritty of uh, the definition of digital platform to start. Um, I think that that in itself raises questions and just sort of the idea of creating a new regulatory body rather than empowering our existing regulatory uh, bodies to, you know, have sort of the knowledge and the expertise to address digital platforms, given that digital platforms are uh, an increasing part of every industry. Um, and so I think that's yeah, where we'd start. Thanks, uh, and uh, thanks to Colin Dallas for hosting this. And, and thank you very much, Harold, for both the fiction speaker and the cameraman. So this is a really welcome contribution to Yeah. 
on Facebook made about 99% of its revenues from digital advertising last year. Google made 90% of its advertising uh, of its top line from digital advertising revenues last year. And all of those ads are traded in programmatic RTD auction environments. And the number one input in those auction environments that drives pricing is user identification and user data. So um, I think it's crucial right now, especially as we have sort of pending investigations and um, at, the, at the sort of federal and state levels and in Congress, that we talk more about user identification, user data, and cookies in digital advertising. Thank you. Um, so a thing we, we like most and a thing we might take issue with. Um, so I, I think at its core, what I appreciate most about Harold's work is the recognition that private sector companies are making a lot of decisions that feel like governmental decisions and that we need to wrestle with that as a society and government has a role in wrestling with those issues. So at, at Facebook, there are four areas in particular where we've been pushing for smart regulation. Um, the first is, is harmful content. That's the issue that I'm working for most closely and I'll probably talk more about it tonight. Um, the second is privacy regulation, which we've talked about quite a bit. Um, the third is election protection, election integrity. And, and the final one is data portability. Um, we think those are you know, themes certainly in the book, but they're issues that we think are incredibly important in terms of just values, political trade-offs that companies are forced to make at this point, but that there are, that, that governments and society ought to be playing a, a, a more direct role in. Um, and I guess that's the transition to the, the thing I might take issue with, which is um, sort of the, the, the focus on a, a, a single agency. And I, I think for me, it's probably more a question of just practicality. Um, we find ourselves in a position where we have to make these decisions, and we can't afford to wait for governments um, to, to come to the table and make these decisions. An example of that would be like the Honest Ads Act in the context of election interference. We can't wait for Congress to pass this sort of regulation, and so we're working to implement it already. And so we're taking the initiative in a lot of these spaces, um, but we want government to be involved and take, take a bigger stand, and it's not clear to me that we can we can. Move. <coughs> <laughs> I've been talking about the importance of interoperability in the context of competition for like two years now. So I'm clearly in very favorable territory. I love seeing that in the book. I love seeing that uh, starting to be teased, though, without that term in the permanent report. And then the uh, European Commission experts report sent to Commission Investiture took that constitution further. And then the recent Chicago Food School Business Report that uh, PK CEO G. Kimmelman was involved with, led by Scott Morton, took that constitution interoperability even further. So, like, these all came out in the past three months, by the way. So I would say the timing of this book is very well aligned with how competition of you is shaping all around the world. Um, like others on this panel, I'm not sure that the one regulator model is, is the one that we're gonna end up in. I'm very glad that I put it out there because it's time to have a conversation about how we do governance here. Uh, I, I think we're gonna increasingly find ourselves in a situation where we don't want governments making a lot of the decisions. We don't want companies making we know we can't just leave it to users either because we see a lot of problems online right? uh, with, with, with the, the, the lack of anyone making the decision or being clear. So we're going to have to figure out some sort of long-term way for the voices and the forces of users, governments, and, and uh, corporations and, and corporate norms and, and, and corporate cultures to, to all come together here. And, and I, I can't tell you what that's going to be. I don't think anyone can right now. So I'm glad that we're pushing it. So let's let's pick out a few uh, topics here from the many that are in the book, um, and, and maybe we'll start with the one that got mentioned the most here. So interoperability uh, as a concept, it sounds like there's a lot of positive feeling about moving towards interoperability, or is it like moving back towards greater interoperability? Um, uh, is are there barriers or are there challenges that you guys anticipate to, to getting to greater interoperability uh, across? How do you see uh, a, a, an expert agency maybe uh, wrestling with that or working with that? Well, one obvious 
these problems of privacy, uh, interoperability in a sense is what gives the field of analytics handle. Um, and there's always going to be a bit of a trade off there. The, the other input to that trade off is uh, informed consent, user input. How does one know where the data is going to, who it's shared with, them, and, and what the intentions of those third parties are? So, so that hopefully is a, is a question for some good, some comprehensive privacy regulation, which, is, which has to be part of this space. But it also has to be part of the, the interoperability conversation. Um, the reason why I think that needs to be with a, uh, why, why an expert agency would be useful on that is because of what happened to the uh, local phone companies uh, uh, in the, uh, after the, the, the 1996 Act, where uh, unbundling was mandated interoperability with the incumbent uh, long distance network. <laughs> And yet, their service calls were answered a little bit slowly. Things didn't work as quite well, for the, quite as well for the new phone companies as for the incumbent ones. And add those all, add all of those up and, and, and put the vast majority of them out of business. Um, that's the sort of thing I, I, I think a bad agency could address. And that was Chris. Yeah, I mean, I'm too um, So, interoperability in the digital platform context occurs via APIs or application programming interfaces. I probably don't need to explain that concept to this room, but I spent a lot of time explaining it to competition regulators around the world over the past year or so. Um, I think it's it's going to be hard, it's going to be uh, important for uh, someone in government to be able to look at specific changes by platforms to their APIs and make a call. Was the deprecation or the shutting down of this API of the evolving technology and business. Was it made as Facebook's change to graph 1.0 API before us in the wake of Cambridge Analytica like in reaction to a privacy or security concern? Um, and even if it was made in reaction to a privacy and security concern, was it made right? Was it done in a calibrated way? Or was the, the string tight a little bit too much? And now interoperability was, uh, was not allowed to continue when it could have been while still protecting the underlying privacy and security concerns. So, there's a really fine grain really context-specific process that needs to be gone through by a regulator with the capacity, the technical capacity, the technical skills and resources to be able to look at what's going on, what the company did, and measure that against a set of predictable principles to try to give some clarity and guidance to the company so that they know how to behave in a good pro competitive too. It's going to be hard, but it's important that we start talking about it now and that we start getting the resources principles in place that we can do predictably and right. And just to follow up on that, what Chris is saying is basically these problems were solved, and um, they were solved through APIs that existed um, and were used to accomplish this very hard task that we think is going to be so hard to implement, but that um, the, the functionality was, again, shut down. So. Um, just, I, <coughs> I feel like I'm <coughs> So just if you think about it in the context of, of Facebook, there's, I think there's no question that you own your own data on Facebook. You own what you post, what you say, what information you disclose. Where it gets tricky is when it's information that your friends have shared with you. So Chris and I are friends on Facebook. I actually think we are friends on Facebook. We are friends on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so he shares with me a post, or he shares with me his birthday, or he shares with me where he works. Um, if, if we're thinking about being able to take your data as Andy to a different platform or to interoperate with another platform, what did we do with Chris's data that he had shared with me? Which, at least in the context of Facebook, it's Chris's data that makes my experience on Facebook, or, or all of the Chris's, all the people I'm friends with, that make the experience on Facebook valuable. And that's where it gets hard. The, the, the idea that I own my data, I think, is uncontroversial. But where do we draw the line with other people's data when they share it with me? That's where it gets really hard. And, and with everybody else, like that is where governments need to, to step up and help draw those lines. Um, the topic I wanted to bring up that uh, was discussed in Herald's book, but was not discussed. This, you didn't really uh, flesh it out in this conversation about content moderation uh, uh, here on stage. Uh, was Herald's book had a full throated defense of uh, Section Two Thirty. Um, and uh, there's a lot of talk in Washington right now about stopping <laughs> that law um, uh, uh, over concerns of uh, you know, it, uh, allowing platforms to let harmful content uh, online, uh, illegal content online. I'm curious uh, what 
Who wants to go first? Yeah. I'm happy to go first. Okay. Uh, well, to, to borrow some of uh, Andy's contextualization from the last question, like, if this, let's not talk about this in a vacuum. It's a bit specific laws and proposals and things that come up in the context of Section 230, right? We worked on CESA FOSA over the past year. The, the bills of Congress, I won't bother giving the acronym, they were related to limiting the safe harbor under Section 230 uh, in the context of sex trafficking. We were extremely concerned, particularly about the early versions of those bills, as I think were most people in California, because of the ways in which they uh, went about solving this problem. Um, because of the lack of their necessity to make this kind of change in the law to achieve the goal that was being set up by the um, I, I think there were a lot of concerning elements of that. So like we would we would from from my team's position, position so when, not if, when the next bill to scale back section 230 gets introduced. We're going to need to look at that and try to understand why. Um, we will almost certainly sympathize with the problem because these aren't coming from nothing. This is, uh, well, it's not exclusively at least driven by a willful, intentional desire to punish things. Um, it's, it's driven in large part because there's a lot of stuff online that's awful. Like the internet is not healthy right now. We've talked about that a lot in the civil context um, through our internet health report publication. Internet. So we, we share the concerns that are motivating the attempts in the U.S. to do more about unwanted content online. We share the concern um, that's motivating European politicians to look at reopening the e-commerce directives, and that's almost certainly going to happen in the next year or so. Um, doesn't mean that you actually need to change 230 or the e-commerce directive in order to achieve the goal of making the internet. Liability, and so so I think that's an important contribution. Mitch, I mean, 
uh, you know, we're just the works on transparency report at Google, and uh, they're collecting all sorts of information about uh, moderation, uh, you know, uh, uh, any of their works with the, uh, the oversight boards. It's been referred to in the press as like the Supreme Court uh, for uh, decisions around content moderation. Uh, if you had concerns about the government getting involved with making some of these decisions, uh, that Post in Harold's book, I think he had you know, kind of a, a hybrid government involvement, but also private sector um, uh, uh, self regulation with some standards. Uh, I mean, where do we draw that line about you know, uh, the government's involvement in deciding what we need to track, what we need to uh, know about uh, these content moderation decisions? Actually, I think maybe some transparency is a great idea. This is something that my organization.
much apparel, so I'm agreeing. But, um, <laughs> but uh, as we look at the power of antitrust law, I'd love to you know, get your take on um, uh, what, it, what you think uh, uh, antitrust can and cannot do when it comes to these competition concerns that were raised. Um, uh, and especially looking at, you know, as new businesses, new business um, Streams are rolled out by companies. How do we decide when they've crossed the line where something is competitive or a new vertical or a new merger uh, uh, is harmful? How do we deal with those sorts of questions? Okay. Uh, there was a lot. Yeah. I know that was a lot. <laughs> Sorry. Straight face after I think that's 
happen? Or is space uh, Facebook defining ownership in some other way that most people would not be familiar with? Because uh, I think of ownership as meaning you have control. And if data that is on Facebook ends up in Cambridge, England, on some other server not controlled by Facebook, and you don't even know that it happened, how does that comport with ownership? <clears throat> yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question, it's a fair question, and I think that the Cambridge Analytica scandal was certainly uh, a, a breach of trust by Facebook and by our developer partners. Um, and it happened, as, as I think Carol mentioned, back in 2015, and subsequent to that, actually, immediately following that, prior to this becoming public, we made a number of changes to lock down our APIs to prevent things like that from happening. I think at the principles level, though, the, the idea that stuff you put on Facebook, you should be able to take where you want to take it, um, is something we've tried to embody for a long time. You can already download all of your information on Facebook. We joined the data transfer project to really sort through some of these questions about what you what you do with sort of the Chris data that you shared with me. Uh, but there, there does need to be a, a, a regulatory um, uh, component to that to sort through some of these harder questions. Okay. Please, yeah, come on up to the microphone. I saw Anne's raising the Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. 
go to this question over here. Yeah. I don't think it's a problem to have different agencies handle different aspects. Again, I actually, um, while it's useful to think of digital platforms as a sector of the economy with a unique set of problems, that doesn't necessarily mean that all of those problems are going to be solved through the same mechanisms or the same agency. Um, one example of merger conditions, though, Merger conditions are actually a little bit troublesome because they're one-offs uh, and because they tend to be time-limited. Um, often, I think, ex ante rules of conduct are going to be a better way to go than rules enforced through merger conditions applied to a particular merger, usually for five, ten, seven, ten years after that merger. Question, yes. So, one question I have for, for each of you is that um, leaving bad faith concerns aside, what is different about the landscape now that saying we'll just wait for competition to magically arrive and sweep these companies away in the way that they swept away the companies that were before them? Before Facebook, there was MySpace. Before Google, there was like those X site, a whole bunch of other websites that people weren't alive and had even never heard of. Um, so, what is different now that's waiting for things to resolve themselves as all this happened before, supposedly? What's different now? Why do we need some sort of intervention at some level to fix things? I think we had a period of time where, where we had the same disruption, right? So in the social network case, there was very strong competition for the first six, seven years of the market, and then the growth trends just shifted Sectors 
advertising, Facebook doesn't lead. We think of these as all pretty competitive markets, but that's not, that's not a reason for not regulating in smart ways. Because as I, as I said at the beginning, there are, there are essentially governmental functions that a lot of these companies find themselves compelled to, to serve in a lot of situations. Um, and so it's appropriate for government to, to intervene in those spaces. And, and again, from our perspective, we think it's privacy, election integrity, harmful content, and data portability. <coughs> in the first instance. We're, 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 we're reaching our, our time limit here, and we're going to wrap up, and you just said Facebook doesn't dominate in advertising. I mean, there, there, there are a lot of people who are going to challenge that. So do you want to? <laughs> you, you're, you're pointing to Google. Who, who the, you're saying Google, uh, but you know, there are a lot of folks who would argue that there's a duopoly in dominance here. I mean, I, I think there are a lot of people that would argue. I'm, I'm stepping into the uh, antitrust uh, domain, which is not my expertise. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm focused on content. But I mean, depending on how you define the market, um, you, you, you get very different answers. But even if you narrowly define it as digital online advertising, it's, it, Facebook is not. Oh, okay, well. Right, so if you narrowly define it as digital online advertising, which <laughs> I do think it's more useful to, to think about those metrics rather than to focus on uh, market definition questions, which is just I found immensely hard. Okay. Excellent. Well, first of all, help me thank our panel for coming up here and wrestling with all of uh, We could keep going for a long time. Uh, we can't tonight. It's 8 o'clock, uh, and that's the end of our program. But uh, I want to thank you all for. First, I want to thank everyone who's been watching the stream. We appreciate it. I want to thank you all who came out in person. Uh, we don't get out to the West Coast a lot uh, at public knowledge, and so when we do, we really appreciate you guys coming out and supporting uh, and engaging in, in these important discussions. Um, uh, final thank you to, again, to our sponsors, Postmates and uh, Mozilla, for helping us put this together. Uh, there's a lot of refreshments in the back, so please hang out.